Smallville fans, the time has come to rank all 10 seasons worst to best, which I found kind of a challenge because some of the seasons that even have some of the worst episodes still have some of the best moments. So how would you go through and rank all 10 seasons of Smallville? Let's do that in the comments. Welcome to Durbania, I'm Durbin, and this is my ranking of all 10 seasons of Smallville worst to best. And if you want more details on what I think of a particular season, check out my playlist, Smallville Talk. It is jam-packed full of Smallville videos, plus my seasons one through 10 season by season theological reviews where I go into all kinds of details. So come hang out with me there and let's talk Smallville. And right now, let's dive into this ranking. Number 10, Smallville season four. This falls in the number 10 position because Honestly, this season has some of the worst episodes of the show, and it has the worst plot line of the show. And yes, I'm referring to hashtag the Lana drama, hashtag in the Lana drama. I mean, the whole witch plot is an absolutely pointless plot. I mean, the whole idea of season four is these three Kryptonian stones of knowledge, and Clark is sent by Jarrell to get them to unite them. The Luthers want to get them to unite them. The Teagues want to get them to unite them. What business does Lana have with anything Kryptonian? The answer is none. We gotta make Lana important somehow. Therefore, Lana must be possessed by an ancient witch who in her past was hunting down these three stones to take over the world, and she wants to get vengeance of, on the Teague. So she has these two things that she wants to do. Now, season four shows us that Clark is vulnerable to magic. So you would think if they're gonna do this dumb plot, it would actually have a purpose and go somewhere and lead to some sort of epic showdown, either between Lana and the Teagues or between Lana and Clark. Either way, you think this is going somewhere, let me tell you, it goes nowhere. And in the end, in the season finale, the showdown is less than two minutes before you even get to the opening song, and the witch kills Teague and leaves, therefore only accomplishing 50% of her goal. In school, that's an F. So she completely failed with no real true epic showdown and without her accomplishing the other part of her goal, which is to get the three stones herself. So it's just like, why would they throw this in here? I mean, the only thing I could think of is to stain the stone with blood so that it would call out to Brainiac's ship, which that was pretty awesome, bringing Brainiac into it. But beyond that, it's like, I, I don't get it. And plus it has episodes like Ageless with the exploding baby where Lana and Clark play house and such a pointless episode that adds nothing to the season or the show and it makes no sense. You have this corny episode spirit where this cheerleader possesses people. I don't, so it does have some of the lowest lows for me, but let's end this on a high note because it's Smallville, okay? So it's got some awesome stuff. We get Erica Durant as Lois Lane this season. She is my favorite live action Lois Lane. And she and Clark have such great on-screen chemistry. They do a great job laying the foundation of their friendship and the relationship that they're going to have in seasons 8 through 10 in this season. And it's just so fun to watch those two together. This season has one of my favorite episodes, Onyx, where Lex Luthor gets split in two and we have the good Lex and the bad Lex. I am the villain of the story. That is freaking epic, man. I love what they do with Lionel, like when Lionel and Clark switch bodies, or when Lionel becomes the oracle for Jarrell and gets downloaded with Kryptonian knowledge. Plus, I, you gotta love that season finale where we have a second meteor shower with a second Kryptonian ship that in season five we find out contains Brainiac. And the nerd in me loved it when I watched this season finale air and I saw Clark with the crystal in the Arctic and he threw it. Even though they cut before it turned into the fortress, I went, yes! He's getting the fortress! Number nine, season six. I really wanted this season to be higher. The reason is all the Kryptonian stuff that happens this season. It's incredible. It opens with a bang, with Lex Luthor being the vessel of Zod, possessed by Zod, and the Clark-Zod fight is awesome. I love Clark going into the Phantom Zone for the first time and meeting Raya. She's a great character because she helps Clark realize the importance of the existence of the Fortress of Solitude. It's just such a good and inspiring thing and then she dies and it's so heartbreaking. 
I love him going on the quest to get the phantoms that he accidentally released from the phantom zone when he escaped the phantom zone. I love what they do with the phantoms. And this is a great season introducing us to Martian Manhunter. Freaking Oliver Queen Green Arrow. We get our introduction to him this year. And I love his character. Justin Hartley and Tom Welling are great on screen together. I love the friendship and bond that forms between Oliver and Clark that leads to Oliver being his best man in season 10. I just feel like they do a great job with that friendship and how they help each other out. And we get a young Justice League this season, which is absolutely epic. So why? Why is this at number nine? But you can guess why it's at number nine, can't you? Well, this isn't about what you want. This is about what I want. The stupid Lex Clark Lana Love Triangle is one of the stupidest things this show ever thought I should care about. I don't care. I mean, and the annoying thing about Lana and Lex, she's with Lex to tick off Clark. You know, the relationship gets more and more serious to tick off Clark. Lex proposes to her. She doesn't say yes until Clark ticks her off. It's like, could this be more transparently stupid? I mean, I can't stand that kind of drama. It's it's beyond irritating. And then Lex, you know, gives her these hormones so it fakes a pregnancy so that she's like trapped into marrying him. And so this whole thing is just so odd. It's so weird. It's so wrong. And what drives me nuts is Lana's constant entitlement mentality. I'm not going to ask you to betray Clark's secret if you'll stop denying that he has one. I'll find out the explanation about Clark on my own. She's not with Clark anymore, but somehow she's still entitled to all of his secrets and to know every intimate detail of his life to the point that there's pictures of her in the barn taking pictures of the barn and she's just looking around. I mean, what is she even looking at? I have no idea. Taking pictures of cobwebs. But here she is trying to find Clark's secret in the way she figures out Clark's secret. It's annoying as snot. The fact that she sets a trap, figures out who he is, it's violating. Whereas in season four, Chloe finds out Clark's identity when she wasn't supposed to, and she waited patiently for him to be ready, and only revealed that she knew his secret in season five when it was a necessity. And here's Lana just like, no, I deserve this knowledge, and it's beyond irritating. So to me, I feel like season six illustrates how all this Kryptonian stuff takes Clark forward, and then along comes the Lana drama to bring him Back. And so the season is so back and forth with that junk, that's why it's where it is. Number eight, season seven. This is another one that I thought I was gonna rank higher because every time I've watched season seven, I loved it. And this last time I watched it, no exception. The reason I placed it here is because of how much they tried to do in this season, which is funny because it's the shortest season of Smallville because of the writer strike. So I made a list, I wrote it down right here of some of the stuff they tried to accomplish this season. Supergirl, which I thought was awesome. Zorel and Lara. So Zorel, Supergirl's dad and Laura, Clark's mom. I thought that was cool. Bizarro, Brainiac's return, Veritas, Lex's clone brother Julian, and Lex seeking to control the Traveler. Oh, let's not forget there's been a Kryptonian living on Earth this entire time. And there's so much more that they jammed into this season. Now, I don't think it makes this season bad, but I think we get gypped on some stuff. And my best example is Zorel and Lara. So here we find out in season nine that that orb has the DNA of the Kandorians. And of course, Zorel, his DNA is not in there. So he makes his own crystal with his DNA and he swiped some DNA from Lara so that he could steal Lara from Jorel. And so you have that whole drama going on, but you also see that he has a nefarious plan on Earth to blot out the sun, take over the world. He slips Kal-El some blue kryptonite where Kal-El doesn't know what blue kryptonite does. And it's really cool and very interesting. And even the one episode where all of this takes place, it's good. I think it's good. I think it would have been great if they gave it three episodes or four. Gave it a great beginning, middle, end, and an amazing arc. It would have been awesome to see it do that and tell this complete story. Instead, they took it all and put it in one episode. So I think everything they did this season was great. I mean, I liked Veritas and how the Luthers, the Queens, the Teagues, the Swans were all in on bringing Clark into the world or the Traveler into the world and helping him reach his destiny and be a support for him and all that. There's a lot of interesting concepts that are introduced and brought into season seven that I find incredibly good. It's just crazy when I sit back and think about it, all the stuff they jam packed into it. Plus one of the things that I think bugs me about season seven is the episode where Lana gets Clark's powers. You live with these abilities every day. I think I can handle it. 
And again, that annoying entitlement mentality comes over her. Now she's entitled to the powers and she never freaking lets it go as is evidenced in season eight. And it's just, ah, it just bugs me, you know, to see her get those powers, how she acts on those powers, kissing Lex Luthor yet again when she's with Clark Kent because the show wants me to think there is a real Lex Clark Lana love triangle. Yeah. Anyway, that did kind of drive me nuts. But as a whole, I think season seven is pretty great. It just was jam packed full of stuff. Number seven, season one. I think it's a compliment that season one is right here in my number seven position. Because here are six seasons that I'm gonna name after this that are better than the season, which shows you Smallville laid a great foundation and the show built on that foundation in a very good and very solid way. So bravo that season one is where it is on my countdown that this show continue to produce better and better material. So congratulations, man, I, I love that. And one of the things that will just get you hooked when you're watching Smallville season one, the epic friendship between Clark and Lex. Michael Rosenbaum is the best Lex Luthor, the best live action Lex Luthor there is. And as it builds their friendship, and we even have the episode with that epic line where Lex says to Clark, Trust me, Clark, our friendship is gonna be the stuff of legend. Gosh, it's just incredible. It's incredible to see Lionel Luthor and get an introduction to this new character and how this new character is so cold and abusive and how Lex has been raised in that, not given much of a chance and not given much of a foundation. And then you have the Kents. They're a wholesome family. They love Clark and they poured so much love and care into him. And you just see the foundation that it gives Clark. So it does a great job with that. And it's sad to see Lex envying that in Clark. And it makes you want to see Lex be a good guy. In season one, the last time I was watching, I was like, my gosh, would the world have changed if Clark just confided in Lex this season and, and Lex knew Clark's secret? I doubt it because you really see what a monster he becomes. But this season is the season that really makes you think what a chance there is. Like nothing is set in stone as you're watching season one. Even though you know their destinies, nothing's in stone and you want the best for Lex Luthor. It does a great job with that. I think some of the biggest weaknesses of season one is just some of the freaks of the weeks. Um, it's interesting because I like the idea of kryptonite raining down in Smallville and it affects humans and it gives Clark something to do. It gives Clark, you know, a challenge and super powered individuals to fight. Um, you know, in this season we see he doesn't have all of his powers, so we, we understand he's going to be growing into powers as the show goes on. So it lays the foundation for a lot of interesting things, but the freaks of the week in this, like, that episode drone with the bees, I didn't even rewatch it. I skipped it. And then I also skipped the one with, uh, Amy Adams, I'm sorry, Amy. I'm sorry I skipped your episode, but I also really don't like that episode where she makes health shakes and they happen to have kryptonite in them and the kryptonite realizes, oh, it's a healthy shake? Okay, we'll make you thin. And then she, you know, becomes a vampire that has to suck fat out of people and living things in order to survive. So there were definitely some pretty lame freak of the weeks this season, but it's a great season and a great foundation. Number six, season nine. I think this is a fantastic season of Smallville. It is the eve of the origin. And one of the things I love about season nine, through all the other seasons, his destiny is coming. It's out there, but it's coming. Not this season. This season, Clark's destiny is imminent. I love gothic Clark because, you know, he didn't die physically fighting Doomsday. It was a metaphorical death where his human side died. And this is him in mourning. But it's the Smallville interpretation of Superman coming back in the black suit. And I think it looks cool. And I think they do a good job with it. One of the things I love about this season is the JSA, the Justice Society of America. First off, meeting Dr. Fate. Now, this is the guy who makes Clark's destiny feel imminent and not far off. Like that moment Clark grabs his arm and Dr. Fate looks at him in and sees what we saw in season three, the Superman cape flying through the depths of space. And it zooms back out and Dr. Fate says, your fate is utterly binding. And all the things that he says to Clark to build up his destiny and what he will become and to encourage Clark and encourage Lois is absolutely incredible. I love Dr. Fate in these episodes. I love Hawkman. I love the JSA's impact on our Smallville Justice League and how they helped our team 
perform better and be more organized and a little bit more responsible. It's very cool how the older team, JSA, became mentors to our newer team. So there's a lot of stuff I loved about the JSA and how they used them. Metallo was very interesting this season, how they used him in three episodes, and he had a great character arc, kind of a normal guy with a chip on his shoulder to going insane after being hit by a truck and experimented on by Kandorians and becoming Metallo to finally becoming a good guy again. So I thought that whole thing was interesting. And you have the Kandorians themselves. Clark meets his father in flesh and blood this season. That was kind of cool. The fact that we get Zod in the flesh this season, along with all of the other Kandorians, and how they have this plan to turn the sun red. Lois' trip to the future where she saw Clark was powerless, the world was being taken over, and now she comes back and they get into her head and find that vision, and now they gotta change it. So I thought that was an interesting story, and I thought that was pretty compelling. And I love the season finale, that final fight between Zod and Clark on the roof. It's just seriously one of the best season finale and one of the best fights and how Clark gives his life to send the Kandorians to their true home but by giving his life and taking the blue kryptonite dagger to his chest it allows Zod to ascend to new Krypton so that the earth is saved from Zod's wrath so Clark's sacrifice saved two worlds so I thought that was a really cool and epic ending plus I love the whole phone booth thing where Lois is talking to the blur on the phone and what's so great is finally the season finale when the blur thinks he's gonna go to new krypton and he wants to say goodbye to lois so in the shadows he kisses her and she recognizes him as clark kent and again i love how she just doesn't force him to say i know who you are but she waits for him to be ready to tell her she does get a little impatient but it's fun to watch her and so it's cool how they built that up and how they did all of that in season nine number five season 10 i really do want this season to be higher because it is the final season it's what 10 years have built up to but i like it overall when you take a step back and you look at the season overall it's a great superman origin story dark side arise filling the earth with darkness that darkness that a mega symbol that he brings people with when they give into their dark side connects them to the planet apocalypse which draws the planet towards the earth the only way that can be broken is if Superman becomes the light and steps out publicly as the light so people could look at his face they could look at him and have their hope in him and it would break their bondage connecting them to dark side but in order for Superman to do that he must break the bondage in his own life so it's an incredibly interesting story and I really do like that I think what puts it here at number five is number one a 10-year buildup and we never see him in the suit this is the series finale yes we do flights and yes we do tights come on Tom Welling suit up I mean, he looked like a character out of The Sims when they do the wide shots. It's not really him. It's CGI. And it's like that. Seriously, after 10 years, that's what I'm getting. Even that last shot where he opens his shirt, that's CGI. It's like you can't even put him in the actual just Superman shirt alone for that one single moment. Ah, oh, so that's just kind of heartbreaking. 10 years of buildup and I never ever actually get to see him in the suit. So that does make me kind of sad. It also makes me sad it's one punch and Darkseid is defeated. I just, I feel like it should have been a far more epic fight. I think it's truer of reality because when you turn on a light, there's no battle between the darkness and the light. The light just wins. So I guess that makes sense. But at the same time, Superman's not a perfect parable and it's Superman. Give me an epic final battle. And so I just wanted that final battle to be really, really good. But taking those negatives aside, Oh, also the fillers. Ugh. And by this point, they had perfected the art of having these really lame filler episodes, right? But throwing incredibly good scenes and crucial story moments in those filler episodes so you're just stuck watching them or you're going to miss something incredibly crucial to the story. So that makes me sad. The fillers that existed in the final season, it's like, do less episodes so that you have a higher budget for that series finale. But Anyway, I guess this is my personal opinion, but I love, I love the episode Homecoming where Brainiac 5 comes back in time and helps Clark break the chains that have been holding his life. Kind of like a Christmas Carol and the three spirits. He went to the past, the present, and the future. I love that episode. I love how him seeing what he sees begins the process of setting him free where he becomes Superman. It's probably one of my favorite episodes in the entire show. I love that moment where Clark tells Lois he's the blur and she just runs into his arms and they fall over and she's like 
finally. And he's like, what, you knew? Like season 10 is full of so many great moments. Great moments like the return of Lionel Luther from the Mirror Universe. Wouldn't want to miss how it all turns out. That was really cool, how they handled bringing him back for one last final bout of glory where he's evil Lionel Luther. I also love the build up to the return of Lex Luthor and then he returns. Lex, still say it the same way. Astonishment mixed with a hint of dread yet with a hopeful finish. It was a short return, but it was freaking epic. Number four, season eight. And it's surprising to me because the first time I watched season eight, I, I really didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. And probably one of the reasons is the five episodes where Lana Lang returns, I'm watching it air on TV. That's not a binge where you could do that in you know, a shorter time. That took five freaking weeks. It took over a month to get through that. So I think things like that, making it feel like it was longer, made this season one of my least favorites. But when I was watching it back, it's pretty great. And one of the things that's great about it is it's lighthearted. It's fun. You have Lois and Clark as a team taking what was built in season four and now they're falling in love. They're a fantastic team. And once you see them be a team, you just see what this show has been missing. It's, and you didn't know it was missing until you have it. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. I love it when Clark Kent becomes the blur and he starts talking to Lois on the phone as the blur. Really what it does is it takes season eight and it makes it the most like any classic Superman show we've ever seen. And I love it for that. So this last time I watched season eight, I really enjoyed it. One of the things I never liked, I, for some reason I never liked the Davis Bloom interpretation of Doomsday. But this last time that I watched it, I really came around to it and I really did like that interpretation. While on the one hand, I wish it was more of an epic fight at the end, still overall what they did with that character, how they built him up was really cool. Let's not forget Chloe being possessed by flipping Brainiac. Oh, I think Allison Mack is great as Chloe, but she was also great as a villain, doing her best impression of James Masters playing that role. She is just so unbelievably good. So there was a lot of stuff in season eight that I just forgot about how good it was. So this last time I watched it, I just was blown away by how much fun I had with it and some of the great epic stuff that they do. I think the biggest thing that holds it back is those five episodes where they bring Lana back with a stupid Lana drama. It's, it's irritating. It just drives me nuts because when she returns, it is for five episodes, but it's a pause button. So you have all the stuff you've been building, Clark moving forward, Lois moving forward, everything that we want to see moving forward, pause. We got to do this Lana drama. And then it's like, he, Lois who? Like seriously, that's what it's like to me. And all of a sudden he's all in love with Lana. It's all Lana, 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 until she gets the powers she so greatly covets and then absorbs kryptonite from that bomb and really she becomes what she has been this entire time poison she's poison to clark kent and so then it ends on that weird note and then the next episode picks up as if the show fell asleep and that was a bad dream well i'm awake time to get on with the business of living and it just goes on as if all of that other stuff never happened it is so abundantly weird, but I think it gives us a good picture of Smallville does a lot of great Kryptonian stuff. They do a lot of great stories. They have a lot of great ways of moving these characters forward, but the way they write Lana Lang and use her, it takes all of that and pulls it backwards into this unnecessary drama. And that's what I felt like those five episodes were for season eight. But as a whole, it really was a great season. Number three, season two. There really is so much to love about this season. Christopher Reeve, number one, bringing him into the show, passing the torch to Tom Welling. And it's not just bringing him into the show, it's how they used him as Dr. Virgil Swan, that he intercepted Kryptonian signals, figured out how to read the Kryptonian language, and brought Clark his first message from jor and Lara, and I think that's an incredible scene. This is kal of Krypton, our infant son. Our last hope. Please protect him and deliver him from evil. So what's great about season two is it's this season of origins. You go back and you see the origins of how Lionel Luther, as a favor, helped Jonathan and Martha adopt Clark. And then how Lionel is so evil, he used it as a way to hide one of his unwanted children and to press Jonathan to get what he wants. And it just shows you kind of the evilness and the sinisterness of Lionel Luther, but also shows you like season seven when you learn about Veritas, how... 
he begins to be suspicious of Clark. And after season two with the Red Kryptonite becomes obsessed with Clark and figuring out Clark's secret. And so it's very cool how they build that up. You get the origins with the Kawachi Caves, which I thought was unique to Smallville, and I thought they did a good job with that. And I think it's a pretty interesting, unique interpretation of Clark learning his heritage, learning his origins, learning Kryptonian, the way he met Jarrell. There were so many things about season two that I thought was done so well and so intense. Even the Lana stuff I thought was okay. Like at the end, when Clark is going to face Jarrell, his goal is to blow up the ship that brought him to Earth, and he doesn't know how it's going to end. End, and he's saying goodbye to Lana and you just see the life that he wants and how he just wants to be with Lana and take her to Lex Luthor's wedding and how he's hurting inside and how Lana's just incredibly confused like the way they handle that scene the music in that scene it's so well done so season two is definitely up there as one of my favorite seasons Number two, season three. I love this season for how freaking dark it is. But when I was going back and re-watching it, I was surprised. I thought season two would be at the number two place. But here we are at number two with season three in its place because, it, I'm sorry, it's Lionel and Lex. This is their season and their relationship this season. How we dive deeper into that is incredible, especially with my favorite episode, Memoria where we really get into Lex Luthor's memories of his childhood, what he uncovers about Julian, and how Lionel sees far too late, with far too hard of a heart, how things could have been different. It wasn't Lex who killed Julian, it was his own wife that killed Julian, because she didn't want to subject him to the brand of parenting that Lionel has, in that moment where he's just like, oh. Oh. If I'd known, if you might have actually loved me. Gosh, it's incredible what they do with that Lionel and Lex relationship. That's one of the things that makes it darker. The other thing is Clark being on Red Kryptonite for three months and having run away from home. The way Jonathan takes on Kryptonian powers, and we have our first super fight this season. It is so incredible to see those two fight, and then Clark come home, and how they used Morgan Edge this season. How Lex found out Clark's secret and then Lionel fried it out of his brain and then went, crap, I was trying to fry out of his brain that I killed his grandparents, but he knew that Clark was the traveler? I know your secret, Clark. I know your secret, Clark. I know your secret, Clark. Like, now I don't have that confirmed. Crap! And so, like, it's interesting how they did this season, how they put it all together. But again, what wins it for me is the Lex-Lionel relationship. Coming in at number one, season five. It's my favorite season. Reason number one, it opens with a bang, and we have those two Kryptonians, and that's incredible. Reason number two, the ship contains Brainiac. So watching Brainiac be the Brainiac that he is, and deceive Clark that Zod is good and Jarrell is bad, and he almost got himself trapped into being the vessel for Zod, it's incredible, and I love the fight in the fortress between Clark and Brainiac. I love Chloe coming clean that she knows his secret and how that just deepens their friendship, and I, I love what they do with her knowing his secret. It's incredibly fun to watch this season. I love the fact that this is the season where Clark loses his powers in the first three episodes, and he gets shot, and he dies, and we find out that Lionel is the vessel for Jarrell as Jarrell inhabits Lionel's body, endows him with power, he gets Clark, brings him to the fortress, resurrects him, and Clark stops a freaking nuke. But what's devastating about that is, is those choices set in motion the death of Jonathan Kent, which that episode, it's pretty heartbreaking. I mean, the fact that first Lana dies, and so Clark goes to change time, and when he changes time, Jonathan dies, it's heart-wrenching. And it's one of the reasons I love the episode Homecoming, because it goes back and gives us closure to this episode. This was Jonathan's choice, not Clark Kent's fault, even though Clark changed time. And so when you take Homecoming and this episode and you put them together, it, it's very cool how you see Clark kind of start to fall into darkness and blaming himself starting here, but how Brainiac 5 helps lift him out of that and to let go and say, no, your father loved you and he never had to. So that's really cool, but it's also so sad. I mean, I remember re watching it 
And the thing that makes me, like, really the lump in the throat is the next episode. The next episode where Clark comes home, and uh, the whole episode is about him learning to let go and say goodbye, and Martha's watching some home videos. And Clark happens to walk in right when little baby Clark and Jonathan are on the tractor, and he goes, I'm going to go show them the back 40. Say goodbye to your mother, son. And then he turns the tractor around, and Jonathan looks at the camera and smiles and says, bye-bye. Freaking breaks my heart. So season five is amazing. And then you have Brainiac deceiving Lex and Lex becomes the vessel for Zod. My freaking goodness. The season finale where Zod possesses Lex and Clark is wrestling with everybody telling him he must kill the vessel of Zod, which is Lex Luthor and how Clark deals with that. Like, it's an incredible season as it builds up to this season finale. So season five is a fast paced season with a lot of great stuff in it. Some annoying Lana drama, but as a whole, I love the season. It is my number one favorite. How would you go through and rank all 10 seasons of Smallville? Let's talk about that in the comments. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button to become a Durbanian. Hit that bell by the subscribe button so you're notified for my next ranking video, movie review, theological review, trailer reaction, or anything else I do here. I'm Durbin. Thanks for checking out Durbanian.